Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Beneath the Surface lecture series sponsored by uh, Marathon. Uh, we're here today with Kate Reardon, who's going to tell us a little bit about the work that she's doing uh, with uh, Cal Poly. Uh, let me read her bio real quick. Kate Reardon. Um, is a third year master's student in Dr. Heather uh, Lee Wang's uh, vertebrate integrative physiology lab at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Uh, Kate received her undergraduate degree from Westchester University of Pennsylvania in marine biology, where she studied marine mammal biomechanics. She is currently a crew supervisor at the Marine Mammal Center's satellite in Morro Bay, California, uh, and is a field team leader for her lab's long-term Northern Elephant Seal Research Program. We're really excited to have uh, Kate here today. And the next few lectures that we're gonna have um, are going to be from uh, representatives of the same lab that uh, Kate is in right now. And Kate is gonna tell us today a little bit more about the research that she's been doing specifically on uh, sea otters. So Kate, go ahead, take it away. Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming. I'm really excited to talk about my research and about how sea otters fur is really cool and how they groom themselves. So let's jump on into it. So today I'll start with background, a bit about sea otters, you know, life history, their ups and downs, and then I'll talk about how their fur works. And then I'll get into a bit more of a research side of things, talk about some graphs and data. And then I'll talk about the significance of my research and what are my next steps. So as hey, an real quick, before you get going, I forgot to mention um, what I'd like you guys to do is as uh, Kate's talking today, um, you know, if you have questions during her uh, lecture today, you can certainly put them in the chat, uh, but we're going to go through the lecture today. And then at the end, we're going to take care of all of the questions. So if you have questions today, certainly uh, think about them, compile them, you can put them into the chat. Uh, but as we go, we're going to make sure to field those questions at the very end. Sorry to interrupt, Kate. All good. Important information. Uh, what was I saying? So Sea otters are part of the mucilid family. So other relatives they have in California here are the North American river otter. Um, and then other uh, relatives is like badgers, skunks, and ferrets. So it's a pretty diverse group for the mucilids. Sea otters have the densest fur of any animal on the planet. So as you can imagine, people were interested in hunting that for hats or coats or whatever they used it for. So Commercial hunting for the Pacific Maritime fur trade started in the late 1700s. So the historical range is the red and yellow here on this map. So as you can see, now the current range is just the yellow, so a big decrease. And what the numbers used to look like, so the global Seattle population before the fur trade was around 300,000. And then in California alone, it was about 16,000. Um, and then they hunted them to extinction, or so they thought. And then in 1938, a really small group was seen in Big Sur. And ever since then, the population has been able to come back from that. Uh, sea otters are also protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. They are currently listed as threatened. And each year, the United States Geological Survey conducts a population census to get an idea of how many otters there are in California. Um, because of COVID, they haven't been able to do a true census since 2019. Um, so hopefully they can complete one soon so we have an idea of how many are actually in California right now. So there's actually two subspecies of sea otters. In California, we have the southern sea otter, so in Hydra lutris neurisis. The population is around 3,000, but again, they haven't done the population census for about three years now. So it could be a little bit more or a little less. Um, the range for southern sea otters is just in California, and the predators here are great white sharks, and they give birth to pups all year round. And then body weight is typically 35 to 60 pounds, so about a medium to large size dog, and then males are a bit bigger than the females. Uh, the other subspecies we have in the United States is northern sea otters. Uh, northern sea otters make up about 
90% uh, of the world's sea otter population. So there's around 70,000, so a lot more than we have here in California. The range is from Washington all the way up through Canada to Alaska. The main predator is killer whales and the birthing season is during the summertime when it's the warmest. And then the body weight for both males and females typically is a bit larger than the Southern sea otters. Um, the lifespan for sea otters is about 15 to 20 years, um, and males can reach up to six feet long, but the average length is about four and a half feet. So sea otters are a bit bigger than you realize. Here's a map of the distribution or like the range of sea otters that we have here in California. So we actually have the largest group here on the central coast. But all the way up from Pigeon Point to Point Conception, you can find otters. And then in the darker parts, so like Seaside, Monterey, and Cayucas, and Big Sur over here, we see a higher density of otters. And the reason we don't really see that much of an expansion to the south past Point Conception is because that's where the water gets warmer and there are more uh, great white sharks present. And sharks are currently the highest mortality uh, cause for sea otters. So, Sea otters probably want to stay away from moving too far south. Sea otters are also super important for the ecosystems that they live in. They help maintain biodiversity in Pacific Ocean because they are a keystone species. So by that, I mean that when sea otters are present, we have really nice and healthy kelp forests. Um, that's because sea otters help control urchin populations. So when we don't have any sea otters present, we see a really overbearing um, and desiccate like kelp forest. Um, so what these urchins do is they latch onto the holdfasts and then this releases the kelp into the water column. And once kelp is in the water column, it can no longer survive and it dies. Um, and no other species really want to you know, call this home. Like you don't see any Garibaldi fish here, sheep heads or rockfish really. Over here, when there are sea otters present in an ecosystem, that's when we see a thriving environment with lots of invertebrates like starfish, and then the sheep heads, uh, harbor seals, sea otters, all that kind of stuff. Because when there's kelp present, that means that these animals can hide and get some shelter from predators, which is really important. Sea otters are the smallest marine mammal group and one of the youngest. So they've only evolved around five to seven million years ago, not too long ago. And what makes sea otters so different from other marine mammals is that they do not have blubber as their main insulation, like this Waddell seal does or this bottlenose dolphin. Instead, sea otters rely on fur as their main insulator. Um, and obviously there's lots of drawbacks to that. Uh, seals and dolphins like this are really streamlined and don't need to worry about, you know, taking care of their fur like sea otters do. So let's talk about how does sea otter fur work specifically. So sea otters have two types of hairs on their body. They have guard hairs and under hairs. So these guard hairs are the type of hairs that we have on our head or your dog has. They're circular, pretty thick. And these under hairs, we do not have under hairs. Under hairs have this interesting barb on them or a scale like this that you can see in this photo. And these barbs come together and create a micro meshwork that entraps a layer of air at the base of the skin. So these barbs really come together, create friction and lock together. And then guard hairs, as you can see, also have some scales on them, but not uh, nearly as much or as latchable as the under hairs barbs. And believe it or not, I like to use this example. Um, if you were to go into like Morro Bay and touch an otter in the water, I don't suggest that obviously, but if you were to put your hand at the base of their skin, their fur would be totally dry at that base of the skin. And that is because these barbs on these under hairs create an air layer at the base of the skin. And if you don't believe me, you can see it on otters yourself. So what we see here, this light brown fur, that's where all the under hairs are. They're trapped together and able to totally not allow any water to penetrate. Like this fur is waterproof if the otter is grooming itself efficiently. And then the purpose of the guard hairs then is to lay flat over the under hairs to protect 
that air layer in water. And that's what we're seeing here. So the guard hairs are not waterproof like the under hairs. So you see that they're laying kind of flat over those under hairs for protection. So the way that this fur works is really crucial for a sea otter's thermal insulation. And so they really need to make sure to groom themselves properly. There's also two types of pelages that they'll have. Pelages means a fur type. So as a young pup, they'll have lanugo or neonatal pelage or pup fur. I'll kind of use all those words interchangeably today. Um, and then eventually they'll molt into the adult pelage. And as you can see, it's a lot more uniform in appearance. This, I'm not saying that this pup looks a little scraggly, but this pup does look a little scraggly in comparison to this really nice streamlined mom fur that she has. And then we kind of see right here, uh, the air layer kind of peeking through. Um, so you can really see an air layer on otters so using binoculars. Another important thing for sea otters is buoyancy. Uh, other marine mammals like pinnipeds and whales are neutrally buoyant in the water, meaning they can go up and down very easily in the water column. But sea otters are positively buoyant, so they have to use a lot of energy to dive down. And it's currently known that young pups, like anywhere between just being born to three months, cannot dive. They just float at the surface. So there's this idea that pup fur could be more buoyant because of that. Like obviously something is causing this. And it's a pretty good adaptation at least. So a mom can go off and forage and know that her pup will be floating at the surface when she gets back. You know, the pup won't drown or anything because it's just so buoyant. It's like a cork on the surface. It's also known that otters wrap themselves up in kelp. So kelp just allows uh, the mom or the pup to stay in one place. Uh, just because the otters are so buoyant, they can float away very easily. Another interesting idea that current researchers think is that moms perhaps blow air into the pup's fur. So if a mom is blowing air into that air layer, then that could increase the pup's buoyancy as well. Uh, and I'd also like to point out in this really cool photo, but this mom gave birth to twins, and this is extremely rare for sea otters due to the shape of their uterus. So this was a really exciting day when this was uh, in Morro Bay. Sadly, a mom probably could not uh, take care of two pups. It's a lot of energy just to have one pup, but it is still cool to see in the wild. Grooming is obviously very important for otters as well, since they have the densest fur of any animal on the planet and they have an air layer on top of that, they're pretty much constantly grooming to maintain that air layer, like we're seeing in this GIF right here. What they do is they start at the head, the paws, and the chest and their extremities, and then they'll probably fall asleep like we're seeing right here. So this otter probably groomed and rubbed its face and its chest and its paws, and then it was like, I'm gonna take a rest for a bit before I go off and forage again. They groom all the time. They can groom after diving, eating, socializing, or interacting with other otters, like we're seeing in this video. Also, moms have to groom their own pups as well. So not only are moms spending hours a day grooming themselves, but now they have to take care of another animal to groom. And when moms are grooming their pups, they're grooming off feces off their pup, milk spillage, all that kind of fun stuff that uh, human moms have to deal with as well. I like to think of otters as hair specialists. I don't think I know of any other animal that spends this much time grooming themselves. So if you ever need a haircut, you can ask an otter. I'm just kidding. But they really do spend so much time. And there's also lots of different types of grooming that they do. So we can talk a bit about those. So the first one we'll talk about is the nibble. So you can see otters doing this when they're kind of in a somersault position. They typically nibble on their tail and their flippers, perhaps to get rid of any uh, matting or feces or things like that. There's the stroke. Uh, this consists of them using their tail, kind of like a rudder um, while swimming, and then they'll maybe be grooming with their paws on their chest or their face. So they're kind of multitasking. There's the classic rub, which you've probably all seen before, of just taking their uh, front paws, rubbing them in their face in circular motions like that. We have my personal favorite, the log roll. If you remember how I said they like to groom their uh, face and their paws and their flippers first, the idea is that as they do this log roll, 
Um, they're keeping those appendages dry and then also reintroducing air into their air layer of their body while rolling. Then we have the hang or somersault, which they like to do a lot. And again, uh, it is currently thought that they do this move um, to reintroduce more air back into the air layer. There are of course some drawbacks to relying on uh, fur as your main insulator. Overheating is a big one, especially for a sea otter that hauls out like in Santa Barbara County during the summertime. That would be extremely hot. They have the densest fur, right? So I can't imagine how hot that would be. So uh, hyperthermia is a big issue for sea otters in California, at least. Matting is another drawback. They are constantly grooming. So they have to keep all their fur in check. I know that Monterey Bay Aquarium's uh, rehab program for their sea otters, they keep track of the mats on their otters there um, and try to make sure that okay, they have this mat present on their stomach when, and then they keep track of it and hope that the otter starts to get rid of that mat and isn't just being lazy and doesn't feel like grooming that area of its body. And the most problematic drawback to having fur is oil spills. Um, what happens if an otter swims through oil or if there's an oil spill nearby an otter and it gets on the fur, that oil penetrates right down to the skin and then that causes the air layer to disappear. So otters cannot prop properly thermoregulate anymore. Um, and as you can see, this could cause lots of issues. Here in California, hyperthermia would be an issue, issue. And then up in Alaska, hypothermia would probably be more of an issue for the otters up there. So otters are very vulnerable to the effects of oil spills compared to other marine mammals that have blubber. And most of what we know about oil spills and their effects on otters is from the 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska. So this is kind of the first, sadly, the first real oil spill event that we could then learn how to rehab otters and rid the otters of um, the oil on the fur. Like other oiled wildlife, Dawn dishwashing detergent has been proven to be the most effective to remove the oil. And here in California, here's a, on the right, we have a figure in red right here. We have the sea otter range. So from Pigeon Point all the way down to Santa Barbara. And then here are these little black rigs are the oil platforms. And then we have some oil refineries and pipelines. So sea otter range here in red is definitely close to oil platforms. And even San Nicolas Island has a small sea otter population, which is off Long Beach near you guys. So clearly there is a threat and this close proximity uh, can, this close proximity poses a threat to these populations. So luckily there are some agencies out there like the Oiled Wildlife Care Network who has volunteers on call and trained to deal with oiled wildlife from sea otters to uh, birds and et cetera. Um, and research has been done trying to understand the effects of oil on sea otter thermoregulation, but it's only been done on the adult fur or that adult pelage, not for other ages like juveniles and baby sea otters. So for my research, I was interested in trying to answer that question. So the main questions I'll be talking about today are when do sea otters transition from that baby fur, which is what we're seeing right here, the really long blonde hairs, into that adult pelage, which is what we're seeing here. I also am interested in how does the thermal insulation and the fur buoyancy differ across ages? So to answer these questions, I uh, put the pelts that I have um, into a thermal conductivity apparatus and I measured the insulation when the pelts were dry, when they were wet. And I'd like to point out here in this in-water photo, this silvery sheen right here is what the air layer looks like in water. So when you put sea otter fur in water, the hairs flatten naturally, the guard hairs lay over those under hairs, right? And then it creates this silvery sheen of the air layer. So it's pretty cool to see. This is obviously in an undisturbed uh, pelage, but uh, when sea otters swim, you can also see this like silvery sheen. Like if you ever go to the uh, Aquarium of the Pacific or Monterey Bay Aquarium, and you happen to get really close to the otters there, you'll see the silvery sheen of the air layer there. And then my last question 
is are sea otter pups more vulnerable to the effects of oiling? Since they have that different type of fur and no one has investigated this yet, and the close proximity to these oil platforms here in California, uh, I applied some crude oil to the fur to see how that would affect it. So now let's talk about how I did this experiment with sea otters. So I didn't actually use any live sea otters. I used sea otter pelts that were collected opportunistically by California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, when I say opportunistically, I mean that no otter was harmed for the purpose of my project. Um, these otters either die during rehabilitation, like at the Marine Mammal Center or at Monterey Bay Aquarium, or these otters were found stranded um, or died on the beach, and then the fur was, in, was still in a good, good enough condition for me to use. So I have about 40 sea otter pelts um, spread across uh, six age classes. And it took about eight years to collect all these otter pelts. So it was not an easy task. And one of my questions is, okay, we know that sea otters eventually molt into this adult pelage. And some past research thinks that it happens sometime in between 13 weeks. So somewhere in between the small pup and the large pup uh, age class. So I was hoping to answer or confirm that idea that it happens somewhere in here, because we can see this big transition from these really long blonde hairs to the more adult-like looking fur. Okay, so now let's talk about when do sea otters transition to that adult fur? And to answer this question, I looked at sea otter guard hair length. And if you remember back, way back 12 slides ago, um, the guard hair length is, or the guard hair's uh, function is to lay flat over the under hairs to protect that air layer in water. And this image right here is just a reminder of what the guard hairs look like. Um, so on this axis, we have the guard hair length. And then down here, we have all of our age classes. So what we're seeing here is that there's a pretty big difference between the two smallest or two youngest age classes. We have the neonates and the small pup. So then we see a pretty big decline in guard hair length. So the pup fur or that lanugo is a lot longer than in the older age classes with that adult pelage. And then we really see, just like how we thought that the small pup and the large pup, somewhere in between those age classes, we would start to see that molt occur. And then on this large pup uh, bar right here, we see a pretty big error bar um, and that's probably due to what I did for this experiment is I would go to a pelt and randomly pluck one guard hair. So the chances are that I plucked, you know, one of the residual neonate uh, pelt hairs uh, or one of the new adult pelt hairs uh, is definitely possible. And then this kind of answers the question that why are baby sea otters so fluffy in comparison to the other like older age sea otters. And that's because they have these extremely long guard hairs. As you can see in this photo down here with the mom and the pup, the pup looks a lot fluffier than the mom. And you can even see in this photo here, those really long guard hairs sticking out. And then we have the under hair layer stopping about right there. So you can see the difference uh, with these longer guard hairs. Um, and I know this slide is really fun to look at. So I'll give you guys a few more seconds to look at it, then we'll move on. Okay, so still talking about guard hairs. Uh, now we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce a topic called hair circularity. So to define hair circularity for you, hair circularity is the minor and major diameter of a hair. So our hairs are a perfect circle. So our hair circularity would be one, like the number one, um, and any number, any, number below one would indicate a flatter hair. So what we're seeing here is a guard hair that I cut at the widest point. And then I measured under a microscope, the minor diameter, the small white area arrow, and the major diameter, the longer white arrow. And if we look at the results here, we have age classes and average hair circularity. There wasn't a significant difference between the hair circularities for all age classes. 
And if we were to average, all, average out all these numbers and put them next to each other, this is what the hairs look like. So from neonates all the way to adults, they all have this ellipsoid shape. And we see a bit of elongation in the hairs as the otters age. But what makes this so beneficial is if we think back to the function of the guard hairs, the function of the guard hairs is to lay flat over the under hairs to protect the air layer in water. So if sea otters had guard hairs that were a perfect circle, that would not be enough area to completely cover all of the air layer. So by having this ellipsoid flattened hair, otters are able to have more surface coverage and be able to protect the air layer longer while out diving before they can come back and groom themselves again. Um, so the take home here is that guard hair shape and structure is really essential for air layer longevity. And then you can kind of see how important the shape is. Uh, in these gifts, we have otters swimming around, kicking. Um, and when, us, when we swim in pools, we obviously have bubbles come off our body. Um, like these otters do here, but we also as humans, we don't have uh, air layer at the base of our skin. So perhaps some of these bubbles that are coming off of these otters while they're swimming are bubbles that are just, or air just dissipating out of the air layer. Um, and the shape of these guard hairs would be pretty helpful in trying to reduce uh, the air bubbling out from the air layer. Okay. Now moving on to the next question that I wanted to answer was, are pups more buoyant than adult sea otters? Current research thinks that sea otter pups are kind of like a big cork at the surface um, and they just cannot dive for the first few months of life. So to answer this question, I looked at the fur buoyancy. Um, so what I did is I made this apparatus, pretty much a tank that had a scale and then I would attach a 3D printed thing, that's what we're looking at right here, and put the fur in. So what this really means is that I calculated the buoyant force of the pelage mass in air, so when it was dry, like what we're seeing in this photo, and the pelage mass in water. So then I would put this pelage on this glass plate right here. And then to make sure that I was just calculating the pelage or the fur buoyancy, not the fur and the skin buoyancy, I then had to take the skin mass in air and the skin mass in water. So to get just the skin, I had to shave the otter pelts. It is not very fun. Since otters have the densest fur of any animal on the planet, you can imagine that it took me a while. Like this is a five by five centimeter pelt sample. And that took me about 45 minutes to shave down. So, and you can tell this was about 20 grams before I shaved it. And then at the end, it was about 14 grams. So they do have pretty dense of fur. <laughs> and I did this uh, fur buoyancy study for three different treatments for each pelt. So I did a control, which is like your classic, took my pelts out of the freezer, blew it dry for a bit. Um, so it was a normal condition for sea otter fur. Then, I applied crude oil to the pelts um, and massaged it in similar to how an otter grooms itself and then put uh, the oil pelts. I got the scale weight of that and underwater. And then lastly, I washed the pelts off with Dawn and then got the in water and in air weights for that. Um, as you can see here, we have an air layer, a really pretty air layer right here. That's what the silvery sheen is for the control. And then the Dawn has a little bit of an air layer, not as good as the control. And the reason behind this is because when you wash fur with Dawn, it not only removes the crude oil from the fur, but also any natural oils. Um, and it's also pretty hard to reintroduce an air layer uh, after being oiled because the oil penetrates down to the skin and it's hard to just reintroduce it. So sometimes we were able to get the air layer back for the Dawn trials and sometimes we weren't. Um, but since we got the in air and the in water weights for these, this is a in water photo right here. So as you can imagine, the, con the conditions in the water weigh less than the in air measurements. So since Seattle's have this really nice air layer, when we put uh, this control disc in the water, it lifts 
up the glass plate um, and it weighs less. So it's just interesting to think about how there's a lip force occurring all because of this air layer. So now to talk about the graph of it, uh, we have fur buoyant force on the y-axis and then all of our H classes again uh, down here. So what we're looking at is the control treatment, normal condition for sea otter pelts. And we have, we found that there was no significant difference across age classes, which is surprising considering everyone knows that neonates and small pups, perhaps some large pups can't die for the first few months of their life. Um, so this kind of contradicts that idea, like, okay, yes, sea otter pups cannot die, but it isn't because they have a really big air layer in their fur in, compared to other age classes, which is interesting. The next treatment was Dawn. And again, we see a decrease in fur buoyant force. So not as much of a lift uh, for the fur here, but it's still decent. And then lastly, the fur buoyant force for oil. So after I applied the crude oil is similar or a little worse than uh, the Dawn treatment. So what this means is that Fur buoyancy is the same regardless of sea otter age and pelage type. Um, this is only looking at the fur though. So, you know, there are other aspects to consider when we're talking about, you know, sea otter buoyancy. And I'll talk about that a little later. Like perhaps, you know, since neonates are so buoyant, um, I only did like a five by five centimeter swatch um, for the pelt, but, you know, an oiled otter that does not have an air layer, it probably would not be as buoyant um, as it was pre-oiling. Um, pretty much oil fouling and Dawn really decrease the buoyancy of the pelts and other factors uh, must be responsible for why young sea otters cannot dive. The next uh, question I would like to address is do adult sea otters have warmer fur than other age classes. I don't wanna go into all the nitty gritty methods that I use to get this data, but pretty much to measure how well of an insulator sea otter fur is, I measured the pelt thermal function using a variable called thermal resistance. The equation for thermal resistance is pelt thickness divided by thermal conductivity. Uh, pelt thickness is kind of just the skin uh, measurement or width skin thickness, there we go, and the fur thickness or the fur loft. Um, and I did this for three different uh, treatments. Again, so we have in air, in water, and when oiled, so the, how this process works of measuring the thermal function is that there are wires in this machine that's called a thermal conductivity apparatus that measure temperatures over a certain period of time. That's what these orange wires are. There's also orange wires underneath the pelt as well. And then I measured it in water. So by just applying normal cold California ocean temperature water and then oiled. So first let's talk about in-air pelt thermal function or dry pelt function. So here on this graph, we have thermal resistance now on the y-axis and age classes on the x-axis. And to orient you, high thermal resistance values uh, signify that it is a good insulator. And what we're seeing here is that all fur types are equivalent. There was not a significant difference between the younger age classes or the older age classes was across the board, pretty much the same. However, if we remember back to the guard hair um, results, how these two age classes, the neonates and the small pups had longer guard hairs. So since pelt thickness is involved in this equation, uh, the longer guard hairs change that pelt thickness value to be different than these large juvenile, subadults, and adults. So it turns out that these longer guard hairs make these younger age classes uh, equivalent, have like an equivalent thermal insulation to the older age classes, which is really interesting. Um, oh, I would like to go back. I wanna say that pelt thickness is different than fur density 
Uh, fur density is like the amount of hairs per square centimeter, but pelt thickness, again, is just that thick, like the kind of like the width of a pelt from the bottom of the skin to the top of the fur. So just because these younger age classes have uh, longer guard hairs, that does not mean that they have more hairs present on their body. Um, I have some preliminary data pointing to the idea that adult sea otters definitely have more dense of fur. Um, I have some histology work that's happening right now to answer that question, but also I know from shaving over 40 otter pelts that the adults take about 15 to 10 minutes longer to shave than the younger age classes like small pups and neonates. Now adding the next treatment, which is in water. So we're in the thermal conductivity machine and now we have water applied to the fur. And what we see is a decrease in thermal resistance, but still a pretty good insulator. Obviously sea otters spend most of their time in the ocean. So clearly this thermal resistance is efficient enough to allow sea otters to survive in the cold Pacific Ocean. Um, however, what this really just means is that there's a smaller air layer than there is in air. Um, and this is really all due to that air layer. And this also kind of makes sense of why sea otter moms typically have their pups on their bellies um, and then rather than in the water to keep them out because pups cannot, don't have as good of thermal resistance when wet. And also um, moms like to keep their pups pretty well groomed and dry, at least during the first few months of life before they're really getting to learn how to forage and swim around like we see it around six months old. Um, but really we see a pretty good air layer still for the in-water treatments. So thermal function is still pretty good, pretty good insulator still. And that's all due to those amazing tiny, tiny little barbs on those under hairs. Okay, now to answer the last question, is our sea otter pups more vulnerable to the effects of oiling? So we're still talking about pelt thermal function, but now we're just gonna pinpoint on the crude oil aspect or crude oil application that I did um, to give you a bit of a background on what I did. I wore proper protection, I wear gloves, mask and all of that. Um, I tried really hard to get uh, oil from California, but no one really wanted to give me oil from California because it's a carcinogen and they're like, legally, we cannot give it to you. But of course, I found this website in Texas <laughs> that very uh, quickly was like, yes, we'll give you crude oil. Um, the website was not sketchy, though, I promise. It was like a guy that advertise the crude oil for educational purposes, like for teachers to use, which I'm kind of like, I don't know who, what teacher would be using crude oil for things, but if you need a crude oil guy from Texas, I got one. Um, but what I would do then with this oil is I'd warm it up to the temperature that it is at when it like seeps out from in the ocean. And then I would uh, massage it into the fur, similar to how an otter grooms itself. Um, I've watched otters groom themselves a lot. I'm a volunteer for Sea Otter Savvy. So what I, I just took my knowledge in their, on their behavior and did that. Um, so, and I applied the same amount of oil to each pelt. So now to talk about all of the thermal function treatments together in comparison. So again, high thermal resistance values mean that it's a good insulator. And what we're seeing now with all these three treatments together on this graph is that it's, it makes a very nice pattern. In air is the best insulator by far for all age classes. Then we see a slight decrease in the thermal resistance for in water, but still a pretty efficient thermal resistance to allow sea otters to survive in the water. And then lastly, the new oil treatment on this graph across the board is just horrible thermal resistance detrimental to any age class. So what we're seeing here in air is the best insulator. And that makes sense why moms like to keep their pup extremely dry and on their belly to keep them out of the cold water. In uh, water, uh, the body heat dissipates into the water just like how it does for us. Uh, I like to use the example, you know, if you're sitting in a pool that's 72 degrees Fahrenheit, versus standing outside when it's 72 degrees Fahrenheit, you feel a lot colder 
in the water. So your body heat is just dissipating out. And it makes sense that moms like to keep their pups out of the water. And then lastly, boiled condition, you can just say bye to that air layer. It no longer exists. It penetrates right to the skin. And then the otter can die from things like hypothermia or hyperthermia. And it's pretty sad. Um, what this looks like on a pelt, uh, here's one of my pelts where I just applied a little bit of oil just in the middle. And you can see the big difference in appearance compared to the really nice air layer, well-groomed area. It just looks like a big old mat uh, in the middle of the fur. And then if we scale this up to the whole otter, it's really sad to think about, you know, an otter just swimming through an oil spill without even knowing what an oil spill is. And then all of a sudden they try grooming themselves and all of a sudden there's just all this brown goo all over them that they can't get out. Um, and they tried, they may be ingested too. So it's just a big old mess. Um, but luckily, again, there's Dawn out there that can help us. Dawn is again known to clean oiled wildlife very well. The only downfall to Dawn is that it removes the natural oils from the fur, um, which isn't great. Um, it's still not really known what exactly the natural oils are doing, um, but they're definitely present just like us. We have natural oils in our hair, so do they. Um, during this experiment, I also collected data on the amount of Dawn I needed to like move all, or remove all of the oil from each pelt and the time it took to clean off each pelt. Um, I haven't had the time yet to analyze that data, but it would be interesting. And in, so I have this idea that neonates and younger age classes have not as much fur as the adults, right? So would that require less dawn and take less time uh, than the adults who might have more fur or because neonates and small pups have longer guard hairs, do they take longer to clean or more dawn to clean um, than the other age classes? So there's a few different ideas with that that could you know, lead to an interesting result. And then also with this uh, data of like how long it took and how much dawn, it could help rehabilitators like the Marine Mammal Center, Marine Mammal Care Center or uh, Oil Wildlife Care Network understand like the cost, how much time it takes to wash a full otter of oil. Like, does it take four hours to wash a baby otter or does it take six? How much Dawn will they need? Will they need a gallon or will they need four gallons? It kind of can give you an idea of like the supplies you'll need and uh, the commitment of taking on an otter uh, that's oiled. There's also other aspects to consider. Like let's say you get an otter and you need to clean off all the Dawn the otter will have to go under sedation, right? And then imagine being an otter and coming out of it. And then all of a sudden you're perfectly clean, but now you smell like Dawn. You don't smell like yourself. You know, they feel like they're in a whole new body. So rehabilitators just need to take that into consideration that like they have no, none of their natural oils anymore. They don't smell like themselves. It'll take them a while probably to start grooming themselves again because they just feel so out of it from all the oil on their fur. To wrap it up, the significance of this research, like why am I doing this? Um, no one has ever investigated uh, otter age classes other than adults. People really have only used adult sea otter fur for studies um, and fur density estimations, things like that. Uh, and so what I found was that pelt thermal function and the fur buoyancy does not vary across uh, age classes. So the pups are not at bad of an insulator compared to adults or compared to juveniles. And fur buoyancy speaking, the pups are not any less buoyant or any more buoyant than the adults. And we can officially say that all sea otters are vulnerable to oil fouling, not just the younger age classes. All sea otters have an air layer and if oil penetrates that air layer, they cannot properly thermal regulate. And with the close proximity of all these oil platforms and refineries down here on the central coast, there's definitely a threat. And just by having agencies like the Oil Wildlife Care Network, you know, having volunteers always be prepared to, you know, run to the scene, that's really great. Um, so hopefully if there is ever a big catastrophic oil uh, spill down here, uh, we'll be able to save the otters um, by understanding you know, how their air layer works 
how oil affects their air layer, how dawn affects their buoyancy, and etc. Also, this is the first study to really describe the lanugo or the pup fur. Uh, I have, like I said earlier, I have 40 samples of otter pelts that took eight years to collect. So most people, when they're doing a scientific research project, like that's a long time. And my advisor put in that order like years before I met her. And so then the year that I got into grad school, she was like, yeah, I actually have the sea otter project that I've like <laughs> had on the back burner for like seven years, um, but I think it's time like we could do it now. And so I just like came into this project at the perfect time when we had just the right amount of samples to complete this project, which is really lucky. And not many grad school uh, stories happen like that. Um, but to give you some narration on this video, I'm blow drying a sea otter pelt to Lanugo bearing one. And we see these long blonde guard hairs and then underneath this lighter colored brownie gray, those are those under hairs. So it's so dense, like this is on the highest setting of the hair dryer. And at no point do you ever see the skin, right? Even if you pull back all the fur, you won't see the skin. That's how dense their fur is. Um, so again, I might be able to calculate the hair density, but there's just so many hairs that it's hard to even picture that. And then at the bottom, we have an adult pelt here. So again, can't see the skin, but here we have the most of the under hairs right here. And you can see where the under hairs stop. And this is where the guard hairs are up here. So guard hairs are still longer in the uh, older age classes. They're just not as blonde typically. And again, can't see the skin at all <laughs> down here. Uh, the only you know big question that I still have after doing all this research is why Seattle pups are so buoyant. It's still pretty unclear. Um, and in this top uh, video, you can see this mom, her body in the water looks a lot different than the pup. The pup just looks like it can hardly move. It looks just like a cork floating in the water. Um, so there's definitely more of the mom's body, uh, you know, underneath the water line than above. But it looks kind of like the pup is more above water than underneath the water line, which is interesting. And so I'm trying to answer this question of, OK, clearly the fur buoyancy is not why pups are so buoyant. So I've my next steps is to create the ultimate sea otter buoyancy model. So for this, I'm taking the fur buoyancy data that I have that I talked about today. And you can see here that air layer, like I just pulled this pelt out from the water tank that it was in. And you can just see how vo voluminous this fur is. The air layer is still very intact. So it's very interesting. And the only part of the pelt that's wet is those guard hairs that are peeking out over those under hairs. So fur buoyancy plus the lung volume. This is a new project that I'm working on in collaboration with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Again, I, uh, these lungs are collected opportunistically from otters that have died near where I live. And then we will take out the lungs, I will inflate them, and then I put them in a big tank of water and then the tank of water has a hole in it with, so that the water can come out and I can measure that water mass. So pretty much what I'm collecting with this is how much water is being displaced by these lungs. And then using that displacement, I can calculate or estimate the lung volume that way, which is really cool and hasn't been done before. So fur buoyancy plus lung volume plus body displacement. Uh, so for body displacement, I went to Monterey Bay Aquarium during uh, COVID, meaning that I was the only one there sitting in front of the otters. And I would set up a camera at, at each window. If you've been to the aquarium, you know there's lots of windows around. And then I would just record for hours. I have over 700 videos from Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and what I'm interested in calculating is how much is the total body displacing in the water. And to calculate this, I use a ship architect's equation. So what ship architects do is they draw out 11 lines evenly placed throughout the otter or throughout the ship. And then this allows them to calculate how much of the hull or the bottom of the boat is being displaced in the water. 
and they would then measure the you know from the water line up to the top of the boat or to the otter and then from on this line this is one from the water line to the end of the otter so you just go along measuring like this um, and then with all those measurements you're able to calculate how much this otter is displacing in the water um, which is really cool so right now i'm kind of pretending like an otter is a boat never thought i'd be doing that but it's really interesting so the fur buoyancy plus the lung volume plus body displacement of these otters would give us a really great idea of understanding how otters are so positively buoyant um, and if it is because they have really big lungs. Uh, otters rib cage goes about two thirds their body length. So that means, you know, they have pretty big lungs and unlike other marine mammals that exhale before they dive, otters don't. So they pretty much always have uh, air in their lungs, which is interesting. There's lots of people that are involved in this project. I have lots of collaborators, Monterey Bay Aquarium, all my amazing undergrads and other volunteers that have helped me and my funding sources. Um, I'd like to thank you all so much for listening. I really enjoy talking about my research. Uh, so if you ever have any questions, my email is up here. Um, and I'd also like to use this time to encourage you all to be sea otter savvy and respect the nap and do not disturb wildlife. Thanks, and I'll gladly take any questions now. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, really, really interesting stuff, and I look forward to uh, your ultimate sea otter buoyancy study uh, in the future. Um, we have a, a, a couple questions. Um, uh, Adia has asked a couple questions uh, about the sea otter fur. Um, first question being, uh, does the otter, does the air layer keep them warm as well as dry? Muted myself for a second. Yes. Yeah. So imagine that we have, like, the otters have a constantly really warm blanket around them that, uh, as long as an otter is grooming itself efficiently, um, it keeps them warm um, and waterproof at the same time. So it does both of those things because of the barbs on the under hairs. Yeah, good question. Um, and then uh, in reference to the, the samples that you have, um, the first samples that, that you have, they come from, from different sea otters. You have total, I think you said you had 40 or so different uh, sea otter pelts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Um, so I pretty much organized them by age. So I have like the estimated age of what the animal was um, and the really small and young otters are a bit sad because the piece of pelt that I have is pretty much like their whole body, but then other adult pelts that I have is just ginormous. Um, but yeah, that process took a very long time and California Department of Fish and Wildlife did a really great job of organizing all of them and gave me like really big pieces that now I can just cut up into smaller pieces for whatever I have a new idea to work with. Um, so if anyone ever needs otter pelts, I still have plenty. Um, yeah. Um, Adia is also asking, uh, aside from the fur and the lungs, um, what else on their body might contribute to buoyancy? Uh, fur and the lungs, what else could contribute to buoyancy? Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure what else physiologically, but otters definitely have a different body shape than pinnipeds. Like otters spend most of their time on their back than um, swimming, you know, on their stomach like cetaceans and uh, pinnipeds that are neutrally buoyant. So I'm sure that that direction that their body naturally is in all the time could play a uh, um, could play a role in this because their body is just naturally like perked up uh, in an orientation that doesn't really allow for that. And then their lungs would naturally, because of gravity, get pushed down a bit, um, which would also, of course, make them pretty buoyant. But uh, I'm pretty sure the lungs, to give you guys an idea of an adult otter lungs, like from the top of the lung to the bottom of the lung is like this big, which is bigger than our lungs. So I'm pretty sure the lungs could be the answer of why sea otters are so buoyant. 
And I think you might have just uh, answered Sarah Kerr's question. Would you say that otters have a larger lung to body size ratio than other marine mammals? Do you know about the comparison? I don't. Oh, actually, I did inflate a weird thing. I inflated a sea lion lung before I did an otter lung for practice. <laughs> so I wouldn't like, you know, mess up on the otter. Uh, that we, I just happened to have a sea lion necropsy in a class that happened. So that's how I got that. I didn't hurt the sea lion. Um, but since pinnipeds have more oxygen stores in their muscle and their blood, they don't really rely on their lungs for oxygen as much as otters do. Because otters do not have more oxygen in their blood and their muscles. Um, so they really only rely on their lungs. And since they don't exhale before they dive, um, they always just have air in there, but pinnipeds do exhale before they dive. So again, they just really rely on the oxygen in their lungs um, to help them, you know, oxygenate their muscles while they're diving. Um, yeah, so I would say otters have a larger lung to body size ratio than other marine mammals, yes. It's another paper you can, uh, you can write there. Yeah, I'll just never graduate, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, Janelle Ross is asking, how do you decide what frame of the picture to use uh, when they're moving around? I think she's referencing the, um, the displacement uh, pictures that you were using, the, the, the sea otters as boats image. Yes. Um, how, do you, how do you figure out which frame to use? Uh, that's a good question. I'll go back to that. So when I'm watching the videos, I look for the otter to be pretty much right flush against the glass because if they're any further, any distance away from the glass, then my scaling isn't as accurate. Um, so I look for them to be up against the glass and typically the water line not to be moving around a lot. So what we're seeing here is a really perfect water line, but otters like, especially at Monterey Bay Aquarium, they pace around the um, exhibit a lot. Um, so it's hard to get a good shot of the waterline perfect like this. Also, sometimes they have their head down for some reason, or they're kicking their flipper up. So there's lots of images that are almost good, but I pretty much look for this exact position of knowing that the otter is pushed up against the glass. And I can tell by looking at the head, because you know, water kind of morphs things. So if the part of the otter that's underneath the water line lines up perfectly with the part of the otter that's above the water line, then I'm like, okay, this is a good, it's flushed up against uh, the glass. And then that's when I overlay all of these numbers on top. So there's definitely a lot more times when I don't get this, like they're rarely in this position. They're just always moving and eating or fighting with each other. So yeah. How many, how many images do you think you're gonna need to get that study done? I have currently 600 images from the 700 videos that I had. So that sounds like it should be good. Yeah, I think I think I'm good. <laughs> but it took very long to get that. Yeah. Um, well, we'll just, you know, make a comment to your reviewers. Uh, that should be <laughs> fine. Um, and and Mikhail is asking, um, can you revisit um, what otters are doing while grooming? Uh, what are they doing to help to control that air layer, add air um, to yeah. that, that under fur? Yeah, so when they're grooming, they rub it circular motions. And the idea is that that is, you know, moving the hairs around. And if they're moving the hairs around, then just the air can re-enter that air layer. Um, it's just kind of like fluffing, fluffing themselves a bit, if that makes sense. Um, and that is kind of how they help control the air layer. But then there are also other grooming techniques that I mentioned um, that is like the log roll when they like stick out their flippers um, and roll around in the water. And the idea is that they're keeping their appendages dry, but then also as they're rolling their body in the water, that's reintroducing air into the air layer. Um, and so that, that they don't have to like physically go like this all over their body all the time, even though they also do that as well. Um, it's kind of, it's hard to know exactly which of those techniques is reintroducing the air layer. Um, to give you an idea on how I groomed the otter pelts, I found that padding them with paper towels 
removed moisture the best. Um, and then like, but also patting them with paper towels and rubbing like this, that got a lot of the water out much more quickly than blow drying it for whatever reason. And then I brought this up to Monterey Bay Aquarium staff and they said, oh yeah, towels work a lot better to dry off otters than a uh, hairdryer. So for whatever reason, um, All right. it works, yeah. Uh, if you ever get a chance to see sea otters, um, either I think Morro Bay and Moss Landing are some really great places to observe otters, uh, keeping your distance and making sure not to disturb sleeping otters. Um, if they're not sleeping, they're constantly moving around. They're super fidgety. They're either eating something, cleaning something, spinning in the water, um, yeah. or they're not moving at all because they're asleep. Um, mm -hmm. They're rarely just kind of chilling, but awake. Uh, all right, uh, as Sarah is asking, uh, oh no, sorry, Sarah already asked that question. Um, Janelle is asking maybe, maybe bone density um, or structure as a factor in their buoyancy um, as a possibility, something you can uh, think about, look into. Um, uh, and uh, Larry is asking about uh, the fat percentages in, in pups versus adults. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, are otters fat at all? That's a really good question. So I'm trying to remember. So um, seal species have something called brown adipose tissue that is kind of like baby fat that keeps them a bit warmer than other types of fat or muscle. Um, but I'm pretty sure that sea otters do not have that. Yes, they don't have that. Um, so they really just rely on their uh, fur and their air layer to stay warm. However, the northern sea otters, so the subspecies in Alaska, they currently are kind of developing this subcutaneous adipose tissue layer, which is a precursor to blubber. So sea otters evolved like five to seven million years ago. So I'm, I don't know how long this would take, but perhaps that adipose tissues that the northern sea otters are starting to get um, could then lead to being blubber, um, but that brown or that subcutaneous adipose tissue is not currently found in southern sea otters, um, and there are no differences in uh, that for younger otters versus older otters currently. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to check back in another few million years. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, something interesting I read um, that uh, marine mammals. Uh, are, are actually very lean. You know, we talk about them outside of sea otters having these thick layers of blubber, um, which is fat, but the muscle itself is actually incredibly lean. Um, so maybe putting all of that fat resource into their uh, blubber rather than into their, you know, like you would see inside of a, a mammal would be integrated within. Yeah. I just thought that was interesting. Um, and I think that is all of our questions. Um, Thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing all of this with us uh, today. Your research is really fascinating. Um, I uh, applaud you and all the work you've done. And uh, we look forward to hearing from uh, more of your colleagues over at um, uh, the VIP lab at Cal, Cal Poly. Um, and we'll catch you guys next week for another uh, edition of uh, Beneath the Surface lectures. Thank you so much for joining us um, and look for your, uh, your emails and on social for uh, our next event. Thank you so much. Thank you.